The subcommittee will come to order. The chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. Today's hearing is the first in a series of hearings this subcommittee will hold on the subject of prescription drug abuse, which has been described by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as an epidemic in the United States. In 2010, 7 million individuals aged 12 or older, that's 2.7 percent of this population, were current non-medical users of prescription or psychotherapeutic drugs. And over 1 million emergency department visits that year involved non-medical use of pharmaceuticals. Nearly all of these drugs were originally prescribed by a physician. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, prescription drug abuse is most prominent among young adults, age 18 to 25. NIDA also reports that in 2010, almost 3,000 young adults died from prescription drug, mainly opioid overdoses, which is more than the total number of people that died from overdoses of any other drug, including heroin and cocaine combined. Opioid pain relievers such as Vicodin and Oxycontin are the largest class of abused prescription drugs, followed by stimulants for treating attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, such as Adderall and Ritalin, and central nervous system depressants for relieving anxiety, such as Valium and Xanax. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, published by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, of those individuals who used prescription painkillers non-medically in 2010 and 2011, nearly three-quarters received the drugs from a friend or relative, either for free, that's 54.2 percent, through a purchase, that's 12.2 percent, or via stealing the drugs. 4.4 percent. Today's hearing focuses on the federal government's response to the prescription drug abuse epidemic. It should be noted that this committee has played a key role in facilitating prescription drug monitoring programs by authorizing the National All-Schedule Prescription Electronic Reporting Act, NASPR, co-sponsored by Representative Whitfield and Ranking Member Pallone. NASPR, which is housed at the Department of Health and Human Services, was signed into law on August 11, 2005, to assist states in combating prescription drug abuse of controlled substances through the PDMP. It provides grants to set up or improve state systems that meet basic standards of information collection and privacy protections that will make it easier for states to share information. PDMPs enable authorities to identify prescription drug abusers as well as the problem doctors who either overprescribe or incorrectly prescribe prescription drugs. While NASPR is an excellent step in the right direction, the program has not been funded since fiscal year 2010, although HHS continues to fund state PDMPs through grants to support interstate interoperability and integration of PDMPs with electronic health records and to improve the timeliness of access to PDMP data. It is abundantly clear that the prescription drug abuse epidemic is a crisis in the United States. However, while we discuss this complicated and dynamic issue, we need to keep in mind that many of these medications that so many are abusing are critical for many patients living with chronic pain. The Institute of Medicine estimates that there are more than 100 million adults in the U.S. living with chronic pain. It is critical as we move forward that we remember that these medications are vital for many Americans experiencing such pain. This hearing will help us better understand and define the various components of the issues and the challenges we face. In addition, this subcommittee will learn about the programs we currently have in place and their level of effectiveness. Today's witnesses represent the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the FDA, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. I look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you. And uh, does anyone seek time? I guess we don't have time. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time and now recognize 
the uh, gentlelady, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to ask if I could put the testimony, uh, the opening statement of Mr. Waxman into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, I'm happy that we're having this hearing on drug abuse in the United States, and I'm glad that we can work together in a bipartisan manner to tackle this problem. I want to welcome all our witnesses today. This hearing provides an opportunity to raise awareness and discuss action that we can take to end a crisis that is truly destroying lives, hurting families and communities across the country. My constituent, Peter Jackson, tragically lost his 18-year-old daughter, Emily, to this epidemic while visiting family. Emily's cousin offered her an OxyContin tablet that had belonged to her uncle, who had recently died of cancer. After taking the OxyContin tablet while drinking, Emily went to sleep and never woke up. She died from respiratory depression. She stopped breathing. While well, Emily's story of uh, dying after taking a single unprescribed OxyContin tablet may be extremely rare, deaths from the abuse and misuse of prescription Opio opioid uh, drugs are not. Prescription opioid drugs were involved in 16,650 overdose, de overdose deaths in 2010, accounting for more deaths than from overdoses of heroin and cocaine combined. This represents a 313% increase in deaths over the past decade. In addition to those tragic deaths, there are other negative health consequences that result from prescription drug abuse. For every overdose death in 2010, there were an additional 10 abuse treatment admissions, 26 emergency department visits, 108 people with abuse or dependence, and 733 non-medical users of those drugs. In addition to the human toll, there are financial costs associated with prescription drug abuse that our healthcare system simply cannot afford. The direct health care cost of prescription drug abuse exceeds $70 billion each year. <coughs> Research has found that on average, opioid abusers generate direct costs 8.7 times higher than non-abusers each year. It is a national imperative that we work to end this crisis. Reducing the prevalence of prescription drug abuse will save lives and save money. There are actions underway that are helping to combat this problem at the federal level. Last year, we passed several provisions as part of the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act to combat prescription drug abuse, including a requirement that the FDA hold a public meeting on the scheduling of hydrocodone and issue guidance on developing abuse deterrent products. Federal agencies also are also operating programs to combat prescription drug abuse, including developing and supporting efforts to educate providers and populations at risk for prescription drug abuse. While federal efforts are critical, we must partner with states if we are to be successful in ending prescription drug abuse due to states, due to states responsibility to license and train the healthcare professionals that prescribe and dispense these drugs. We must also build on current efforts by ident identifying additional steps that we can take to tackle such abuse. We must make drugs containing hydrocodone Schedule II drugs. While it will be important to take steps to ensure this change does not limit access to patients with, limited, with legitimate medical needs, this change is needed to adequately reflect the potential risk these drugs pose to public health. We should also take steps necessary to restrict the use of oxycodone pain relievers to severe pain rather than moderate to severe pain in order to prevent the overprescribing of these powerful medications. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the federal government's efforts to combat prescription drug abuse, to learn additional steps we can take to stop the abuse and misuse of opioid drugs, and I appreciate any comment on the uh, suggestions that I made in my testimony. And I yield back. Chair, thank you, gentlelady. Now I recognize the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for an opening statement. I thank the Chairman for the recognition. You know, the fact of the matter is that we lose more people in this country due to drug overdoses than we do to automobile accidents. And of those drug overdoses, two thirds of them are prescription drug overdoses. So we've got a plenty big problem. The good news is there's plenty we can do about it. But Unfortunately, the agencies and lawmakers have uh, so far not taken anything other than a short-term approach. We really need a broad-based comprehensive strategy that's focused on going after the bad actors. 
So to start, we could go after the pill mills. They may be hard to find, but maybe not. They advertise, so we're very fortunate. They tell us where they are, what their hours are. They tell us their charges. So if I can find them, how come the Board of Pharmacy can't? How come law enforcement can't? And take a hard look at this. Look, I ran a medical practice for 25 years. Never once did I advertise a free initial visit, dispensing on site, discounts off meds, coupon included. This warrants a hard look. It just doesn't fit a normal type of medical practice. We should reauthorize and fight to fund NASPR. This committee reauthorized it in the past. It's the only authorizing legislation that encourages state prescription drug monitoring programs. NASPR was a product of this committee, bipartisan, drafted with medical providers, states, and patients in mind. We should encourage qualitative drug screening and reject contrary Medicare policies. We should encourage abuse deterrent formulations and reward investment in these technologies. We might also work with Canada to align our policies in approving and reimbursing these technologies. We should look at the and examine the personal use exemption to see if it encourages building controlled sub, uh, bringing controlled substances into the country. We should do more to shut down the rogue internet pharmacies at home and abroad. It boils down to this. Right now, you can go to a publication, you can go on the internet and buy a controlled substance by pointing and clicking at two things, two statements you have to make. One, I need the drug, and two, I ain't lying. Most people can meet that bar. I'm open to discussing provider education if it does not subvert, subvert medical judgment. We have allowed a few bad actors to jeopardize the doctor's ability to offer pain care and care for their patients out of fear for patient abuse and diversion. And this is an important point. Being a, someone who's written prescriptions, I do have a perspective on this that says we gotta stop the diversion, but we also need to be careful that our, whatever we do is not so prescriptive that it prevents people who need, have a legitimate need and, and use of this medication to not obtain it. So pain costs are estimated at more than $100 billion yearly, and they're the cause of 25% of sick days. Prescription medications may be an important part of pain therapy. If we don't stop the bad actors, we're going to hurt the people who have legitimate uses for these medications. The bad actors cannot be allowed to jeopardize a doctor's ability to alleviate human suffering. Again, there's much we should do. I understand why this series, why this may be a series of hearings, and Mr. Chairman, obviously I look forward to working with you. We need to involve doctors. We need to involve patients as witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the consideration, and I'll yield the balance of the time to Dr. Gingry. I appreciate my OBGYN colleague from Texas for yielding to me because I agree with so much of what he said. You know, the... <clears throat> The, the problem is a, is a huge problem, and, and not only the cost of uh, 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 the legal dispensation or, or, or prescribing of, of, of these types of medication, pain medications, anxiolytics, uh, antidepressants, whatever, but just think about the cost uh, uh, of decreased productivity uh, in, in individuals that uh, maybe are a little bit, just a little bit over-medicated. Uh, you know, this might sound a little harsh, but honestly, I think maybe a little pain or a little anxiety in our lives is a good thing. It can be a productive thing uh, and, and and make you appreciate uh, that that you have to work through that. Uh, and that and if you try to completely eliminate each of those things, then that's where you get to the dependency, the addiction, the decreased productivity, or the cost to society. So I think physicians have a big role to play in this, and uh, even the ones that are prescribing legally, and I'm not talking here about the, the pill mills, uh, the states are doing, I think, a good job of trying to crack down on that. So, but finally, we must take a close look at how we as a society support treatment and recovery for patients struggling to overcome addiction. We must look for new and innovative treatment plans which treat this dependence and leave the abuser without new addic addictions where they're on some other medication that's supposedly helping them and they're almost just as addicted as they were before. Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I thank you for the time. 
Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the opening statements. The uh, committee has one panel before us today, and I'll introduce those members at this time. Mr. Gil Kerlikowski, Director, Office of National Drug Control Policy, is with us. Secondly, Dr. Throckmorton, Deputy Director of Regulatory Program Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Finally, Dr. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Thank you for coming. Your written testimony will be made part of the record. You'll be each given five minutes to summarize your testimony. Mr. Karolkowski, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. And thank you, Chairman Pitts and Representative Schakowsky and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to address the important issue of prescription drug abuse in this country. Preventing prescription drug abuse has been a major focus of our office since my confirmation uh, now four years ago. And we've worked very collaboratively with a number of federal agencies uh, throughout government to address what the CDC has rightly termed an epidemic. Uh, my position allows me to raise the public awareness and take action on drug issues that affect the nation. And the administration recognizes that addiction is a disease, that prevention, treatment, and smart law enforcement all have to play a part of a comprehensive strategy to reduce drug use, to give help to those who need it, and to ensure public health and safety. And we're here today because the prescription drug abuse has had devastating consequences for public health and safety in the country. Increases in treatment admissions for substance use disorders, emergency department visits, and the, sadly the deaths that are attributable to prescription drug overdoses place an enormous burden upon communities across the country. In 2010 alone, more than 38,000 Americans died from a drug overdose. 22,000 of those overdose deaths were attributable to prescription medications. And most of those deaths, almost 17,000, were attributable to prescription painkillers. And in response, the administration released a comprehensive program called Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan. The plan brings together a variety of federal, state, local, and tribal partners to focus on the four major priority areas dealing with this. Education, monitoring, proper disposal, and enforcement. And the plan promotes mandatory education and safe prescribing and addiction practices for prescribers and dispensers. Current training for health care providers on safe opioid prescribing and addiction can be inadequate and inconsistent. Medical school students receive an average of only 11 hours of training on pain education. Most schools do not offer specific training on opioids at all. Several states, including Iowa, Massachusetts, and Utah, have passed mandatory prescriber education legislation. And we've come a long way in educating the general public about prescription drug abuse. We've worked with a wide array of state government leaders, medical associations, public health and safety organizations to prioritize prescription drug abuse and overdose prevention. The second pillar of the plan focuses on strengthening the prescription drug monitoring programs. In 2006, only 20 states had PDMPs. Today, 49 states have authorized legislation. 46 states have operational PDMPs. There are currently 14 states that are able now to share data across state lines. And we're supporting that expanded interoperability. The administration has worked with Congress to allow the Department of Veterans Affairs to share prescription drug data with PDMPs, and we're pleased to say that the VA's rulemaking process is nearing completion, and VA has authorized its health care providers to access those state PDMPs when consistent with state laws. Third, the administration has continued to expand safe and proper disposal of unused and expired medication. Since 2010, the Drug Enforcement Administration has partnered with thousands of local law enforcement agencies and our drug-free communities coalitions to hold six national take-back days collectively, disposing of, safely disposing of over 2.8 million pounds of unused medication. And lastly, the administration plan focuses on improving law enforcement capabilities to reduce diversion. 
the National Methamphetamine and Pharmaceutical Initiative, funded through our Office of High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas, has trained more than 2,500 law enforcement and criminal justice professionals on pharmaceutical crime investigations and prosecutions. The federal law enforcement continues to partner with state and local agencies around the country to reduce the pill mills and prosecute those that are responsible for improper or illegal prescribing. The administration is working to expand access to naloxone, an emergency overdose reversal medication for first responders who may encounter overdose victims and can help prevent a fatal opioid overdose. We're also addressing many of the other consequences of the e epidemic, including the emerging issues like neonatal abstinence syndrome and indications of increased heroin use in, places, in, in other places throughout the country. In closing, let me recognize that none of these things would be possible if my executive branch colleagues and I want to accomplish uh, for this nation without the support, the ongoing support of members of Congress. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Dr. Throckmorton, you're recognized five minutes for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Douglas Throckmorton, Deputy Director for Regulatory Programs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. Thank you for your opportunity to be here today to discuss the, the misuse and abuse of prescription drugs, especially prescription opioids. The importance of this problem is hard to overstate. Beyond the sobering statistics of our individuals and their families whose lives have been shattered by prescription opioid misuse, abuse, and addiction, it is a crisis that affects us all, and meaningful and enduring solutions will require all of our collective efforts. Balancing the needs of patients suffering from pain with the need to combat opioid misuse, abuse, and addiction is a priority for the FDA and for me personally. In seeking this balance, FDA has pursued a targeted science-based approach aimed at critical points in the development and use of opioid medications. While additional work remains to be done, I'd like to mention some of the activities FDA is doing now. First, we are a science-based agency and are focusing on improving the safe use of pain medicines. These activities include recent work we've done to encourage the development of abuse deterrent drug formulations for opioids. FDA, the FDA believes the development of these new formulations to successfully deter abuse is an important part of our efforts to improve their safe use. For example, in January of this year, FDA issued a draft guidance document for industry outlining the development of abuse deterrent opioid drug products. And in the fall, the FDA will participate in a public meeting to discuss the issues addressed in that draft guidance, as well as issues surrounding the development of abuse deterrent formulations for generic drug products. In addition, the FDA has taken re recent regulatory actions concerning two opioid products, OxyContin and Opana ER, that were reformulated with the intention of making the products more difficult to manipulate and abuse. The data for these two products were reviewed carefully and independently by FDA scientists and re resulted in a change in the labeling for OxyContin. Our decisions relied on the totality of the evidence for the particular drug at hand, and given where we are in the evolving science of abuse deterrence, were made on a case-by-case -case basis. A second critical area where we have devoted time and resources is the development of effective patient and prescriber education. The interaction between prescribers and patients plays a critical role in improving the safe use of these drugs, and the FDA has taken a number of steps to improve the educational materials that are available for patients and prescribers. For example, in July of 2012, we approved a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, known as REMS, for manufacturers of over 20 extended release and long-acting opioids. Under this REMS, manufacturers are required to support the development of effective prescriber training programs, offered by accredited continuing education providers, and to make them available at little or no cost to healthcare professionals. The training is based on a syllabus developed by the FDA with input from, from other stakeholders. We are currently posting those, those educational materials on our website to make them easier for prescribers to find and make use of. A third critical area where we have devoted time and resources is on ways to prevent the overdose deaths associated with prescription opioids by improving the treatment of overdose. Naloxone is an injectable medication that is the standard treatment to rapidly reverse the overdose of either prescription or illicit opioid, and when given quickly, it can and does save lives. At a public meeting the FDA convened last year, 
with several other parts of the federal government, stakeholders encouraged the exploration of new ways to administer naloxone that may be easier than currently available, such as auto injectors or via intranasal administration. In this area, FDA is working to provide regulatory priority assistance to manufacturers who are working to, to, on assessing these new ways to give naloxone. To finish my remarks, our society faces two important challenges. We must balance efforts to address the misuse, abuse, and addiction that harms our families and communities and the need for appropriate access to pain medications for patients that need them. There can be no doubt there's much to be done and that we must act now. These are not simple issues and there are no easy answers. Given the complexity of the issues surrounding this problem, real and enduring progress will require a multifaceted approach combined with the dedication, persistence, and full engagement of all parties. FDA continues to prioritize our efforts in this area to combat this significant public health crisis. We welcome the opportunity to work with Congress, our federal partners, the medical community, advocacy organizations, patients, and families to turn the tide on this devastating epidemic. Thank you for your continued interest in this important topic and for the opportunity to testify regarding FDA's contributions on this issue. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and now recognizes the gentleman, Dr. Clark, five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Pitts, Congresswoman Schakowsky, and members of the subcommittee. I am Dr. H. Wesley Clark, and I'm the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment within the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding SAMHSA's role in preventing non-medical use of prescription drugs and treating individuals who abuse those drugs. SAMHSA's mission is to reduce the impact Okay. <laughs> yes, SAMHSA's mission is to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness on America's communities. We envision a nation that acts on the knowledge and behavioral health is, is, that is behavioral health is essential for health prevention works, treatment is effective, and people recover. The challenge of prescription drug misuse and abuse is a complex issue that requires epidemiologic surveillance, interventions, prescriber education, access to effective treatment services, and continued research by the private and public sectors. SAMHSA's strategy to reduce prescription drug misuse and abuse aligns with the four-part strategy of ONDCP. We work across the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services by participating in the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee's Prescription Drug Abuse Subcommittee. We are, uh, we are in active partnerships with the CDC, the FDA, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology, NIH, and others aimed at preventing and treating prescription drug misuse and abuse. According to our 2011 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, Non-medical use of prescription drug ranks as the second most common illicit class of drugs in the United States. You've mentioned these data, and there's no need for me to repeat it, but it is uh, important to know that there was a slight decline in non-medical use between 2010 and 2011, which suggests that the national, state, and local efforts to reduce prescription drug misuse may be having an impact, but there's still much work to be done. State prescription drug monitoring programs, or PDMPs, are an important component in government efforts to re prevent and reduce drug diversion and abuse. PDMPs monitor and analyze scheduled prescription drugs with the goal of preventing prescription drug misuse and abuse, as well as illegal diversion. In 2005, the National All Schedules Prescription Electronic Reporting Act, or NASPR, created a Department of Health and Human Services grant program administered by SAMHSA for states to implement or enhance PDMPs. NASPA received funding from Congress in fiscal years 2009 and 2010, which resulted in SAMHSA providing 26 grants to 14 states. However, in fiscal years 2011 and 12, Congress did not appropriate funding for the NASPA program. In 2011, SAMHSA funded the enhanced access to PDMPs through Health IT Project, which was managed by ONC in collaboration with SAMHSA, CDC, and ONDCP. The project was unlike the NASPA grants in that its purpose was to use health IT to increase timely access to PDMP data. In 2012, the PDMP Electronic Health Record Integration and Interoperability Expansion Program was funded by SAMHSA. This program complements existing federal efforts by improving real-time access to PDMP data through the integration of PDMPs into existing technologies such as electronic health records. SAMHSA is also engaged in the efforts to prevent and treat prescription drug misuse and abuse through education programs for prescribers and future prescribers, prevention and early intervention programs, treatment of prescription drug abuse, as well as through regulation. We support the education of current prescribers through continuing medical education courses and other less formal efforts, such as webinars. 
The screening brief intervention and referral to treatment program is an important tool for the early identification of persons who might be at risk for opioid abuse and other substance use. SAMHSA provides grants to states, territories, and tribal organizations to implement SBIRT for adults in primary care. We have a residency grant program through SBIRT to address future prescribers and include screening for prescription drugs. We support prevention and early intervention through several other grant programs. Our block grant program uh, is targeted toward funding to states and, and territories for their prevention and treatment and services efforts. The Strategic Prevention Framework Partnership for Success Program is designed to address two of the nation's top substance abuse prevention priorities, including underage drinking and prescription drug misuse and abuse among persons aged 12 to 25. We work with uh, ONDCP on our drug-free communities effort in collaboration to make sure that communities can prioritize uh, prescription drug abuse. We're working with other federal agencies to explore telemedicine to address the need for increased access to in rural settings. Our strategy to reduce prescription drug misuse includes the expansion of improved access to treatment. The Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000 permits qualified physicians to prescribe certain medications for the treatment of opioid addiction in outpatient settings. We uh, also regulate opioid treatment programs that use methadone and buprenorphine uh, approved by FDA to treat patients with opioid dependence. We work in, in collaboration with the DEA. Through these and other efforts, SAM, SAMHSA is working daily to address the issue in order to reduce the significant long-term impacts of a serious public health problem. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding SAMHSA's efforts in this area, and I welcome any questions that you might have. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Uh, Chair apologizes. We're trying to get the jackhammer to stop. But until that time, if you'll please speak directly into the mic, um, we'd appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'll begin the questioning and recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Director <laughs> coordinates the many agencies involved in prescription drug abuse. Please describe the advantages and challenges that come with having so many agencies and departments involved in the fight against prescription drug abuse? Uh, Congress clearly uh, recognized uh, uh, the need for coordination, the fact that there are 15 primary federal agencies that all have a, a role in the drug issue. Uh, I don't think anything is more complex or challenging on the, than the prescription drugs. It's not like an issue where it's coming across the border, it's coming right out of our own medicine cabinets. Uh, the fact, the mere fact that uh, it was not recognized as a significant problem except by subject matter experts in the health field, people that ran treatment programs, but generally the public did not uh, even begin to understand this, the, the magnitude of the prescription drug problem. Absolutely. We worked to bring everybody together to sit at the table and to develop a plan knowing that any one uh, component, whether it was the law enforcement agencies whether it was the regulatory agencies, that any one component would not be able to solve or, or at least significantly reduce this problem. Uh, our partners, two of which are here, but a number of them uh, uh, are, uh, are out uh, uh, as part of our program, all came together with one goal, and that is to reduce this tragedy, not only in the loss of life, but the expense. So we couldn't be more pleased with one, their cooperation, and two, the, at least the inkling, as Dr. Clark said, of su some success in this area. Thank you, uh, Dr. Throckmorton. Uh, generic versions of long-acting opioids without abuse deterrent properties entered the market in January of this year. Does the agency intend to monitor real-time data in order to evaluate whether such entry affects opioid abuse, and how will real-time data like this be utilized by the agency now and in the future when the FDA is evaluating the science regarding claims of abuse deterrence? Mr. Chairman, the, the, the goal that our agency has set is to incentivize the development of successful abuse deterrent formulations and, and find ways to move them onto the market. Um, our, our, our intent is to, to set forth a roadmap that makes that successful, makes that happen in good time. Um, 
following up on that, we need to work to develop ways to move generics that also have abuse deterrent technologies, make them possible to come onto the market as well. Um, you asked about monitoring of the, the response in the marketplace to those sorts of decisions. We do watch that information. We have an Office of Epidemiology that, that focuses on marketing issues as well as post-marketing safety issues. Um, we use that information as we, we look at individual decisions to understand the impact that a decision that we might, ours might have with regards to uh, the use of products in the market. Um, to follow up, the FDA has committed through the user fee process to increase transparency and predictability around the drug review and approval process. Earlier this week, we wrote to DEA regarding delays in reviewing FDA scheduling recommendations for new drug appro approvals containing controlled substances. Does the agency have recommendations in improving this process to address the issue of DEA delays? The, the focus, it's an important question, um, that, that we make sure that we have timely access to new medicines that are, that are recommended for controlling, but we need to um, remember that the final decision about the controlling is, is, is made by the, Dr the Drug Enforcement Administration under the Controlled Substances Act. My focus in the Center for Drugs has been to make certain that there's a timely scientific assessment from the FDA that can in fact can work to inform that decision by the Drug Enforcement Administration. So what we've been doing is, is looking back at our process to make sure that it is as efficient and timely and scientific as possible so we get our recommendations in good order to the Drug Enforcement Administration through our Office of Assistant Secretary for Health, which is at the, the, at the Health and Human Services level. Thank you. Dr. Clark, can you discuss your relationship with the 46 states that operate prescription drug monitoring programs? We're working in concert with the uh, Department of Justice, the Harold Rogers Program. We have, through uh, our special initiatives, uh, reaching out to as many jurisdictions as possible so that we can link the P PDMPs with electronic health records. As you know, as I mentioned, the NASPA program, which was uh, targeted toward uh, grants to states, has not been funded. So uh, we've shifted our focus from uh, that effort to looking at other technologies so that we can address the public health aspect of this by linking electronic health records to PDMP so that we can have real-time data so that the practitioner in the uh, clinic or in the emergency room has access to information about the client uh, sooner than the, some of the delays associated with current state PDMP programs. We can't wait two weeks to inform the clinician. We'd like to be able to give that clinician real-time access to information so they can make appropriate decisions about the care. Sometimes it's someone who's running a scam on the doctor. Sometimes it's a patient who uh, is having a reaction to the medication. So it's really useful to have real-time access to the clinical uh, context of uh, using prescription drugs. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Um, that, my time's expired. Chair, recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm so glad we're here today having a hearing on an issue that really clearly cuts across party lines. Prescription drug abuse is a real and pervasive problem. And while it clearly impacts families and communities across our nation, it also affects our health care system. However, I want to make sure that efforts to address this issue, important as they are, do not cause other problems, especially those uh, for, uh, regarding people with chronic pain. <clears throat> this is a delicate balancing act in a way. American struggle with pain has been an important issue for me for many years. In 2007, I introduced the National Pain Care Policy Act and was pleased to see that part of it was included with the Affordable Care Act. As a result, the Institute of Medicine was directed to do a study on pain. And what they found is that pain is the most common reason people seek medical care. Over 116 million U.S. adults suffer from chronic pain. The severity, duration, and disabling consequences of pain vary from person to person, as does the response to treatment. But pain accompanies a range of other clinical conditions, as all of you know, including cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and on and on. Access to medications is critical for these patients and, their, and survivors in order to complete other prescribed treatments and maintain other activities of daily living. And many medications prescribed to patients for acute pain as well as chronic pain 
contain hydrocodone. So Dr. Throckmorton, as the FDA reviews the potential rescheduling of hydro, hydrocodone containing medications, does sufficient data and analysis exist about the potential impacts rescheduling could have on patient access to hydrocodone containing medications? Thank you, Congresswoman. First, let me say I agree with you. Finding a balance between the necessary access for pain medicines for, for patients that require them and addressing the, this crisis of abuses is absolutely essential, something that the FDA keeps in mind as we're thinking about our regulatory activities. Um, with regard to assessing access for, to pain medicines, it's something that we have worked, worked on internally. It's something I've discussed with outside groups extensively. I know there are a number of people looking at better ways to measure that. It was a part of our REMS implementation that we put in place last mm -hmm. year, for instance. We required the manufacturers to assess the impact of that REMS on access to pain medications because we understand that it's an important aspect of our regulatory activities and, and whatever we end up deciding to do in the future. Um, with regards to hydrocodone, um, Congress, in, 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 in the recent Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovations Act, directed us to hold the public hearing um, on hydrocodone and upscheduling, and in that direction included language directing us to talk to patients and, and groups that had experience on the impact that this might have with regards to, 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 to the upscheduling of hydrocodone. We held that meeting. We have over 700 comments to the docket about that meeting that we're currently looking at. A large number of them comment on the, the effects that different activities might have as regards to access, something that we're reviewing as we, as we think about making our decisions. Thank you. And if there are access problems, could you elaborate? I know there's not much time left, but on the process available to individuals who are rightfully prescribed these medications but encounter problems accessing them. The, the, um, the reason why they're having a trouble getting the medicine I, would, would be important to understand. So if there is a drug shortage, for instance, and there are challenges getting a drug that's not available anywhere in their, in, in their area, FDA has a drug shortage staff that I supervise, and we would love to hear from you. We have a website. We'd want to work with you to find other ways to make that pain medicine available to you. Um, if, it's, if it's due to lack of availability at a pharmacy or pharmacies near you to, to uh, because you know, because of concerns over scheduling or something like that, those things I would I would have less clear answer on. But I would suggest the boards of pharmacy or, or other local area groups like that might be somewhere to, to, to talk to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I I'm about out of time, and I didn't even get to ask the other two members of the panel. Uh, this is such an important topic to, me, to uh, I think for us to be discussing, and I would certainly hope that we could have that. This is just one hearing that we have many more because the, I, I wanted to get into prevention <laughs> uh, be, and that's a whole nother topic that uh, and involves maybe some other uh, people too but you certainly are experts on this. We could certainly use uh, some more hearings on this topic in my opinion so thank you very much for scheduling this one. Chair, thanks gentlelady and this is just the first in a series of hearings we planned. Chair, now recognize the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for questions. Thank you Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Karofsky, you uh, sent a letter. Uh, you heard me reference the, the uh, alignment of our policies with those to our neighbor to the north, and you sent a letter about this. And um, you've got Dr. Throckmorton over there diligently working on abuse deterrence in OxyContin. But how do we align our policies with Canada to prevent the older generic form from coming across the border? Because I probably as we speak about this, I can see someone developing a business plan that would involve the importation of large amounts of generics Oxycontin, generic OxyContin that didn't have an, an abuse deterrent. It's an important issue because the United States has done a lot to uh, uh, reduce the, uh, the, the easy availability and also the fact that, uh, that the uh, opioid prescription painkillers here uh, are not as uh, uh, easily manipulated, but the fact that Canada has that uh, was of great concern to us. So early on, before they hit the market, we had uh, written to uh, the health minister. The health minister from Canada replied that she actually didn't have the authorities within Canadian law. 
uh, to limit this. But she had not only heard from us, she had also heard from the provinces who were also concerned that this would be widely and easily available uh, within the provinces. Uh, so we notified Customs and Border Protection first to, uh, to identify and, and be aware of this in case they, uh, they see these coming through. So far in Milwaukee, that is the only uh, location that we've received a report of seeing some of these, and it, and it was not a, a great number of them. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled in July with our Canadian counterparts who will be here uh, in Washington, D.C., and I will be traveling to Ottawa, hopefully with uh, a colleague from the Food and Drug Administration uh, to also work with them. So you'll be monitoring it? Absolutely. And, and would you be averse to providing periodic reports to, to this committee, to the staff of this committee? I, I'd about, be happy to. About that ongoing effort? Um, you know, let me just ask you on your on your four pillars in your testimony. You talked of the the last pillar was uh, was the the enforcement piece, and you know, despite the salacious nature of the covers of these magazines, I submit to you that I can help you locate the bad actors. They advertise, and it's not hard to pick them out of a crowd. So I hope you're you're focusing some efforts on uh, on disrupting the supply chain. Because again, these people are not shy about telling you who they are and where they are and their hours of operation, their prices, and a discount coupon. You can see certainly uh, uh, Broward County, Florida uh, was the kind of epicenter of this. Uh, they had 90 of the top 100 prescribing and dispensing physicians. This, this magazine is from Broward County, Florida. I wasn't going to identify the location, but since you did. Dr. Throckward, let me just ask you, uh, are there any efforts at the FDA to make naloxone an over-the-counter preparation? Like a like an inhaler or an auto pen. We we think it's important to first understand how best to use the naloxone. So um, we're working as a part of a much larger group of federal uh, agencies to understand the best uses of naloxone. At, as as a regulator, my job in that discussion is not to decide as a policy how naloxone should be used, and instead it's to lay out the regulatory pathway should a, a, a firm be interested in developing one of those products. So we've met regularly with the makers of, an auto, of auto injector products, makers of in, in, inhalational products, to lay out the pathways that are necessary for them to get approval as prescription products. Um, at the meeting that, that we held last year, uh, attended by NIDA, attended by the Austin National Drug Control Policy and SAMHSA, we heard loud and clear that there was a broad interest in moving naloxone to over-the-counter status. Yeah, let me just interrupt you. I'm not sure I agree with that, but we live in a world where levonorgestrel now is available over-the-counter with the Tootsie Rolls and Snicker bars. Uh, if interdiction and, and abstinence is not going to work in other areas, um, you know, maybe this is something that needs to be looked at because anyone who has ever seen the dramatic reversal of an amp of Narcan on, a, on an opiate overdose will understand that you go from crisis to normal in the space of 26 seconds, and it, and it is dramatic. Um, I'm, again, I'm not saying that I advocate that, but I, I just wonder in this brave new world that we've entered, is that, uh, is that a consideration? So I hear that you are, in fact, enter, entertaining that. Mr. Kralowski, I'll just also have to mention about drug diversion, and you mentioned the 11 hours in medical school. You do learn a lot in your very first years in residency and practice, and I just recall very vividly uh, when I was a resident at Parkland Hospital, moonlighting at community hospitals, and someone would come in with a textbook description. In fact, they probably memorized the textbook, but a textbook description of, of renal pain, of renal colic pain, and uh, were savvy enough to bite their lip and spit in the cup before they collected a specimen for you so they had blood <laughs> in their urine and uh, fit the bill pretty quickly. And, oh, I know what it is, doctor. I have an appointment with my urologist. I just need something to get me through the night. And uh, about the fourth time you hear that story, you think there's something fishy here. Of course, doctor shopping is a, is a big problem, and the doctors who are just leaving training and getting into practice, this is where a lot of that educational activity could, uh, could do a lot to prevent diversion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much. I'm, I'm especially grateful to Director Kierlikowski because you uh, have given us such great guidance in the state of Florida where it's, 
colleagues, it has been a, a horrendous problem in the state of Florida. You would not believe, you could drive by some of these pain management clinics and see lines of people early in the morning. And um, I would, we would often hear from our colleagues in Kentucky, in Virginia, in Tennessee, uh, about how folks would just travel down to Florida, find a, find a pain management clinic that would, that would prescribe, give them on site uh, hundreds of pills, uh, go back, and it, this uh, pipeline fortunately has been uh, squeezed now. Uh, there, Florida finally adopted a uh, prescription drug uh, database. We have some stops and starts with that. I'm concerned their physicians and pharmacists are not using it. It's voluntary. Um, I'm a little bit concerned the state hasn't provided a long-term commitment uh, to make it work, and I'd like you all to address that. But local law enforcement, they're seeing some improvements from where we would have at least one death per day in our community from prescription drug ab abuse. They say now with county ordinances on these pain man management clinics, uh, new requirements for to go after the docs, uh, rest of doctors and prosecutions. Uh, but I know local law enforcement can't do it all. Can you all give me a, uh, how, how is the state of Florida doing? Because I know it's been, unfortunately, one of the worst in the country. And then what, at the federal level, what can we do to provide greater tools to local law enforcement? And then my, one of my local sheriffs says it's not all up to local law enforcement. This is an addiction, and we've got to do more. Director. As a, as a graduate of the University of South Florida, uh, uh, I had a special affinity for the, uh, for the problems in, in Florida in particular. But uh, I can tell you that Florida is doing markedly, remarkably better. Uh, uh, the leadership of the Attorney General, Pam Bondi, on this issue uh, has been very good. Uh, we have worked hard with a number of groups there, and Florida has actually reduced the problem, uh, I think, uh, uh, from seven uh, overdose deaths a day. Uh, uh, they've been able to make progress. I think from the federal government standpoint, what we need to be able to do is to make sure that these prescription drug monitoring plans are interoperable. Fourteen states now can share data, but we saw a movement of some of the uh, physicians that uh, were suspect, as the vice chair mentioned, from Florida to other states, and so that information needs to be done. So that's one thing the federal government can continue to do. The, you know, our database is voluntary, and the, it hasn't been up and running for very long, but still there's some frustration that uh, you only have 10 percent of pharmacists that are using it, and, and not many doctors, so if we have interoperability be between states, uh, that still doesn't get to the problem of incentivizing uh, pharmacists and doctors, prescribers, to use that. How do we how do we better incentivize the use of the data? And, and we're actually seeing uh, significant uh, improvements. One is that uh, the electronic health records system. Uh, which eventually uh, w will be compatible with, with these kind of systems so that you don't have one PDMP standalone system and then you've got your other electronic health records. The other is the e-prescribing uh, that has uh, taken hold. Physicians are, are not very happy about being able to prescribe electronically a large number of different types of drugs, but when it comes to controlled substances, they go back to paper and pencil. All of these things are kind of underway, but I think the amount of uh, uh, education and information that is being made to the physicians as a result of using a PDMP uh, and the stories that they've told and the fact that we are strongly encouraging mandatory prescriber education uh, will be helpful. Because, thank you. Okay. And gentlemen, can you all tell me, or I'm a co-sponsor of a bill, H.R. 1285, by uh, Congressman Buchanan from the Sarasota area and Congressman Markey uh, from the Energy and Commerce Committee, it would amend the Controlled Substances Act to make any substance containing hydrocodone a Schedule II drug. Do you, do you all support that? Could you just say yes or no because my time is limited? I don't believe the administration has taken a, a, a position, and uh, we have strongly encouraged the science-based evaluation uh, for the scheduling, so I wouldn't be able to tell you okay. right now. Doctor. He, he's speaking for the administration. Okay. Yeah. And same answer, Dr. Clark. Speaks okay. for the administration. Thank you all very much for your efforts in this area. 
The lady's time has expired. Uh, at this time, I request unanimous consent to include a statement from the National Association of Chain Drug Stores into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Chair now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I just have two um, um, a brief questions. One is, um, I understand in Europe, 85% of their prescription drugs is, is in blister packaging. Um, whether that's correct or not, that's what I've been informed. Uh, do you think that would have any positive effect on some of these specific prescription drug drugs, especially for those that might be going to, you know, families or families who are taking uh, care of seniors and, and the, really the accountability and the inability to really just disperse that without breaking up the package? I think it's a very good, good question. And, and the use of innovative packaging and storage techniques to make a difference in this in this particular crisis. It's one of the things that we've not had an opportunity to think through as fully as we'd like to. I, I formed a group that it, within the FDA to start looking at these issues. I have a, a, a part of, the, of my center that focuses on packaging and labeling and those things, and I've asked them to look at issues like this. One of the challenges about um, putting blister packs, uh, creating, requiring blister packs for one part, one kind of drug is that it it spills over to requiring blister plaques potentially for other kinds of drugs that have, have similar kinds of dangers. And there's a concern about access and, 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 and impact on other, and, in other ways on the healthcare system. So we need to look broadly at how to use packaging more creatively than we have, I believe. Anyone else want to add? No, th then let me just, on this first one, uh, we were talking about some of the, and I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't remember all the names and stuff of the, of the various uh, drugs or the drugs to uh, remediate the uh, the drug effect, but how, I'm curious as how much coordination there is between each of you um, when there is a uh, development of a promising treatment which can help address the national priority of abating the drug abuse crisis. And I do know the FDA really has the approval thought, but are you all involved with them, especially in this case, Dr. Clark? Yes. Uh not only the FDA has the leadership in that, but we work in collaboration with ONDCP, NIH, and, and others uh, as the literature, which as uh, Dr. Throckmark mentioned, that the science-based literature produces new ideas. We have this ongoing dialogue. We have uh, working groups that are multi-agency, multi-department to examine the implications. We also work with the uh, organized medicine and the various medical societies to uh, address these issues. We try to track these developments so that we can decide whether uh, they can be uh, moved into clinical practice. We spend more time with each other than our family. <laughs> That's, some, that's true up here too many times, unfortunately. So, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. And now I recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to um, also uh, reinforce my view. I think I do have something uh, as a comment. That's already in the uh, in in the record when it comes to the uh, changing the schedule scheduling of hydrocodone from its current schedule three to schedule two of the uh, Control Substance Act. Um, that was one of the um, suggestions that came from my uh, my constituent who lost his uh, his daughter. The the other um, was. Um, he, he suggested, and I don't know if this is under consideration, take steps necessary to restrict the use of oxycodone pain relievers to severe pain rather than moderate to severe pain. So that would change the packaging in order to prevent the overprescribing of these powerful medications. Um, I, I wonder if any of, actually, of whoever knows best. Yeah, that, that's, that's probably some, that's something that, that I can comment on. Um, there are citizens' petitions. There are, are, are requests for action before my, my agency um, about uh, the, the changes in labeling that you're referring to. So I won't be able to talk in great specific about 
the changes in what's called the moderate to severe language that's in, in, in current opioid indications. I mean, I will say, however, that the FDA has always had an interest in making sure that our labels are accurate and fair and include all of the information that we know to be, to be scientific. Um, I, I had a public meeting earlier in this year um, where I posed a series of questions to academics, advocates, family members, asking for their help in understanding how our current labeling for opiates might be improved. Um, in, in general, asking them for suggestions, and, and we got a number of comments. Um, we're, in the business, and we're in the process of looking at those comments, looking at other ways to make sure those labels say what they need to. We, we believe educating prescribers begins with the approved labeling, which, which outlines how the products are, are best used based on our scientific judgment, and we need to make those as, as fully accurate as we can. Uh, I wonder if part of the um, con customer, the consumer education, includes encouraging families with children between 12 and 18 to have a lockbox for um, certain drugs so that they keep them out of the hands of, uh, of children. Dr. Clark? Yes, we uh, do believe that uh, mm -hmm. prescription drugs should be treated uh, very carefully. Lockboxes are good ideas. We, uh, as, as Chairman Pitts pointed out, uh, a lot of uh, prescription drugs are shared from between friends and family. So you've got this cultural dynamic that you, we also have to deal with. So consumers and, and, and family members need to be brought in. And our prevention efforts include not only take-back programs that uh, uh, Mr. Kurlikowski mentioned, but the idea of promoting uh, the appropriate management of prescription drugs in the home. Uh, if we, so lockboxes is our one strategy, making sure that we have an informed consumer Another strategy, making sure that the delivery system educates the consumer about the potential risk of uh, misuse and diversion of the medications, yet another strategy. And as uh, 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 was pointed out, we need to reach out to consumer groups and parent groups and c consumer uh, coalitions uh, so that we can promote this cultural shift in attitudes about these medications. Okay, I, I have one more question. It, it, it appears there's a new trend of manufacturers seeking approval of new abuse deterrent formulations near the time of the expiration of their patents and, uh, and marketing exclusivity. So they then withdraw the original formulation from the market, claiming it's no longer safe in light of the availability of the abuse deter deterrent formulation. Um, and if the FDA agrees that the the, the uh, original formulation was removed for safety reasons and the FDA is precluded from approving generic competitors without comparable abuse deterrent formulations. And in the absence of generic versions, then patients are forced to pay higher monopoly prices for extended time periods, which in turn has the potential to decrease patient access to these drugs. Um, have you heard about this? Uh, uh, Yes, and, and this is back to one of where the, the discussion of the balances that, 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 are, you know, that need to be kept in mind as we think about addressing this abuse crisis. So in this case, we have the necessary balance between incentivizing the development of abuse deterrent formulations that work. We want to have opioids in formulations that deter abuse. That, that I, just, I believe that's everyone's best interest, to, to find a way to incentivize that, while at the same time recognizing the impact and importance of the generics in, in, in the U.S. market, um, currently well more than 75 percent of the, the, the total prescriptions, et cetera. Um, accomplishing that balance is something that the FDA is think, thinking and working very hard on. Our first action was earlier in the year when we put out the guidance laying out how we would try to incentivize the development of new formulations. Following up on that, that we're now thinking about ways to develop guidance on abuse deterrent formulations and how, how uh, to, to generics to allow them to come on the market as well. In other places, and in, and, and, and in this place I would expect, our focus would be on the performance of those generics and not on the technology that was used to make that generic. So we would require that the generics demonstrate they are abuse deterrent, the thing that we would all want to have rather than that they used the same technology. We, we think that would, that would incentivize the development of appropriate generics, generics that work, 
um, while recognizing the important role that the innovator plays here in terms of developing new, new innovative products. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Karakowski, um, what percent of docs write what, prescript, what percent of pain of, nar of narcotics? Congressman, I actually don't know. I know that the uh, information about the doctors that do prescribe, for instance, oncologists uh, uh, write a large number of the... Of the oncologists, pain doctors? The, the pain doctors, yeah. et cetera. And I think Dr. Throckmorton probably can also help me. Yeah. I just play a doctor on <laughs> TV. I'm with the real doctor. Uh, and, and I won't be able to give you specific numbers. We can certainly get that. But the majority of pain medications are actually written for by primary care doctors and, and general. Now, that's the majority, and, but if we yes. look at those who write an extraordinary amount, uh, you know, those that are two standard deviations out, by definition, if you're two standard deviations out, you're 5%, right? So intuitively, it makes me, if we're looking, about, looking at the folks who we're concerned about, I'm suspecting that it's going to be a small percent writing a lot of the inappropriate prescriptions. You're nodding your head. Do you think that intuition is correct? It, 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 it depends on where you, where you cut you cut that line off is 5% or it's something like that. But there's clearly a minority of physicians that are writing for large amounts of these, these, these opioids. I agree now, I'm not sure to whom this would go. I think one of the two of you, because I'm not sure this is SAMHSA's gig. But I know if you've got 46 states that have a prescription drug monitoring program, I'm a doc. I have a DEA number. Every time I write that number in, it goes into a database, and they know if I've written an Rx. I think, although I was not able to confirm, these databases likewise have patient information. Now, I keep on wondering if our goal is to find that small percent of docs who are writing inappropriately, and we have a unique identifier for whom that doc is, and we can look up in the phone book and see what their practice is, why don't we just turn it over to Google, let them data mine, and tell us who are the crooks? You follow what I'm saying? I mean, aside from being tongue-in-cheek, if we have all these unique identifiers and all these databases of real-time data, what's the challenge in figuring out which docs are the bad actors? There are a couple challenges that, that really do come uh, up. One is that uh, things can change, particularly in rural areas, uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, if a physician leaves a practice or is gone, and suddenly that uh, physician taking his or her place begins to write uh, a, a lot more prescriptions because they've actually taken over. But, but, uh, but as we look at the data, I mean, knowing that the urban settings are where most of this is happening, but even if it's rural, what you described is a little kind of codicil, but still broad sweep. It seems as if we got a unique identifier, you got a real-time database, and you got 46 states with it. It doesn't seem like this should be such a challenge. You're right, but also, I actually, the, the real devastation has been in uh, the rural areas, Kentucky, Southern Ohio. I'll accept that as well, but again, you got a unique identifier, you got a real-time database. What is the great challenge? I, I think the other challenge is that uh, because these are individual state programs, some within the law enforcement component, some are within the medical practice component, and each state uses those individually to, to determine. So There's does DOJ center. have access to these uh, patient, uh, these prescription drug monitoring programs? Does who have access? Department of Justice, or do you, or does the executive branch? No. So it's entirely state jurisdiction. Exactly. And so, now we mentioned interstate compacts. I presume in these interstate compacts, the states are communicating one to the other as to, listen, this fellow just dropped out, he moved to your state, he's someone you should watch for? Dr. Clark, do you, you, you have a thought? I mean, Well, there are, we are moving toward that uh, uh, position. It is really important to recognize that the electronic health record integration and interoperability activity is moving toward that position. Some jurisdictions are, in fact, uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, algorithms where you can identify the outliers in terms of pain medic. Man, it just seems like a it just seems like a sort. It is a little more complicated than that, as uh, Dr. Throckmorton pointed out, in part because uh, you do, in fact, pull in the uh, cancer doctors or the arthritis doctors. But, or but I know that. But you know who the cancer doctors are. If there are a hundred thousand docs. There's going to be 5,000 who are cancer and 5,000 who are legitimate pain docs, and there's going to be somebody who you know just moved to this state from that state to this state. Indeed. That's what uh, the electronic health records and interoperability Now, program. see, it concerns me that your electronic medical record, because it really I don't want the government snooping in my electronic medical record. 
On the other hand, if we have a real-time database, your patient drug, your prescription drug monitoring program, that is the subset of folks who are writing RXs, and it's centered upon the physician, and you can look and see, here's my top 1,000 writers, 500 are oncologists or pain docs or ortho, and here's 500. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, well, HHS has actually done a survey uh, to looking at Part D programs, and they discovered it was a little more complicated because, indeed, trying to uh, pigeonhole a practice isn't as simple as all that. But you're right with the advent of uh, increasing monitoring capability and big data, we'll be able to make some kind of reasonable assessment so. of a practitioner right. and at least explore sure. with that practitioner what he or she is doing. Okay, I yield back, thank you. Chair, Ch thanks gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, five minutes for questions. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this hearing and thank the three witnesses for their testimony here today. Uh, prescription drug abuse is, is certainly a, a serious problem that impacts an estimated 12 and a half million Americans and now is considered a health epidemic by the Centers for Disease Control. And so it's a serious problem. This hearing today is very appropriate. Uh, this is a conversation that we must have and we must do something about it if we can. Uh, in the last Congress, I served as ranking member of the Commerce Manufacturing and Trade Subcommittee uh, under the then leadership of uh, Chairwoman Mary Bono. Uh, the issue of prescription drug abuse is one that was and continues to be uh, very important to her and to me. Uh, our subcommittee held several hearings on prescription drug abuse last Congress, and so I have uh, a somewhat keen understanding and interest in stemming uh, the growing problem. Uh, the chair then and I share deep concern for individuals' well-being, especially young people who gain access to and, uh, and abuse prescription drugs. Uh, the multiple hearings that we had on this issue during the last Congress uh, made very clear to me that drug manufacturers and the drug supply chain are not the problem. Uh, with Purdue Pharma developing next-generation crush-resistant drugs, the industry is playing an increasing role in stopping illicit use. Nefarious black markets and drug diversion at the end user stage are the problem. And so the question is, how do we address this problem uh, while avoiding burdensome regulations on your manufacturers and others along the supply chain? And so I just want to follow up uh, just a bit on uh, Ms. Schakowsky's uh, line of questions a few moments ago. Uh, abuse deterrent drugs are a fairly new addition to the market. And so what impact, what impact have abuse deterrent drugs had on the illegal and illicit use of prescription drugs? And, and so I, just thinking out loud, I, I would just imagine that if, if one drug is made abuse deterrent, uh, the person will just find another drug that is not abuse deterrent that produces similar results, shifting but not reducing the abuse. Uh, should the FDA, and I guess I can go to Mr. Throckmorton, uh, on this one. Uh, should the FDA remove roadblocks to manufacturers who want to produce abuse deterrent drugs so that they can speed the new formula to market to reduce overall abuse? Yes, we should. Um, and, and we're working to do exactly that. Um, I view the development of abuse deterrent technologies and encouraging their use in, in, in opioids as an incremental progress, process. Um, we're beginning now to walk a road where I'd, I'd hope to see a broad majority of opioids in abuse deterrent formulations. Um, that's going to help address your concern, um, the squeezing the balloon, if you will, the people moving from a, an abuse deterrent formulation to, to another formulation that's easier to abuse. Um, in, in, the, in the short term here, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we imagined that wasn't going to happen. So my job, I think, I, I think our agency's job is to incentivize the development of those new technologies broadly and to make certain that those technologies demonstrate that they work. So we should be developing abuse deterrent formulations that successfully reduce abuse through reviewing of the data. I believe the FDA plays a critical role there. And then rewarding those new formulations and labeling, rewarding them in ways that will encourage their use by prescription, by, by physicians, and by, by patients, um, with a long-term goal of having a broad range of opioids that are, uh, that are in abuse deterrent formulations. All right. Let me now go to uh, Dr. Clark, if I can. Dr. Clark, how can we educate healthcare providers 
uh, to spot the warning signs, the warning signs of frequent flyers who might not have a legitimate need for powerful uh, prescription drugs? Do you think the implementation of interoperable electronic medical records, you mentioned that earlier, uh, would help to flag these individuals who are doctor surfing only to get more and more prescriptions that they need to sell? Indeed, uh, we think that the interoperability between electronic health records and the prescribing is very important. We're working with the Office of the National Coordinated Health Information Technology to achieve that. We think that uh, educating practitioners uh, is important. We work with uh, uh, the FDA and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. We both have uh, training programs, NIDAMED, for the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and uh, SAMHSA has a training program associated with uh, Boston University. We've trained over 13,000 prescribers. Uh, we work with uh, state medical societies. SAMHSA sponsors state medical society training. And we have, as a result of this broader effort that the Congress has uh, uh, mobilized, we're finding more and more practitioners are showing up at our, our, our conferences to uh, listen and learn about uh, prescription drug abuse, to listen and learn about uh, adequate pain management strategies, uh, to listen and learn how to monitor uh, for uh, deviant uh, behaviors and in, 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 in also while maintaining uh, a good balance of care because indeed uh, pain is a problem. So we want to uh, continue that effort. We think that's a useful effort. Thank you, Dr. Clark. My time has expired. I didn't get to Mr. Kilikowski, and I spent considerable time rehearsing your name, and I won't be able to use it, <laughs> but I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Throckmorton, can you please update the committee as to where the agency stands related to requirements of the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act pertaining to public meetings surrounding the scheduling of combination hydrocodone products? Now, I know you mentioned in your testimony uh, that a public meeting had been held, and I think in one of the answers to the earlier questions, you said you all were relying on science instead of going straight to rescheduling some of the drugs. But can you tell us? you know, what you hope for or we're hoping for an update and what you think is the process going forward on this uh, rescheduling? Sure. I, I, I won't be able to talk in any detail because we've not yet formed a, a, a recommendation within uh, about what, you know, the, the, the matter. Um, um, our, our task was to respond both to the science, the request from the Drug Enforcement Administration to reconsider our recommendation from 2008. Um, as well as respond to the language that Congress gave us for in, in FIDESIA, directing us to hold a meeting that included membership to, to solicit input on things like the impact of upscheduling. Um, we're taking those two things very seriously. Um, as, as I mentioned previously, um, that meeting um, uh, elicited 760-some comments, um, over 100 of them making specific recommendations um, for us to consider instead of up scheduling, so making recommendations for other activities, we, we're, we're trying to work through all of all of those to form the any, best science-based. Any idea of a timeline on when you think something might come out? I, I'm afraid I can't. I can't give you a timeline. I can tell you that I I understand your frustration. I understand that this is an important issue that we want to move forward. Um, my people are doing everything that we possibly can. I appreciate to do it right. that. Thank you. Now may come as a surprise to uh, some of you all that Virginia actually has the oldest medicinal marijuana law on the books, uh, dating back to the 1979 Act. Uh, that was, however, unlike some of those were some of those states that have said, you know, if it makes you feel good, do it. Uh, Virginia's actually requires that there be a medical reason and there be a prescription, which is not currently allowed. Wouldn't you agree with me, Dr. Throckmorton, that we need to have a discussion about the legitimate uses of, of medicinal marijuana and freeing it up so that Virginia can uh, exercise its will so that doctors can actually prescribe it in those areas that are authorized by the Virginia law? Uh, my own personal views aside, the, the FDA would not have a clear role in responding to issues around medicinal marijuana. We, we do have a role in the scheduling of marijuana in, in a somewhat similar fashion that we have a role to play in hydrocodone. So there is a recommendation process that the DEA requests of us. That's regarding the development of marijuana drugs. But you would agree drugs. That, that we probably ought to be having a public discussion about legitimate medicinal marijuana usage. I, I, I think I'm not going to be able to comment on, on All right. that, sir. I appreciate that. 
The Center for Substance Abuse Treatment uh, recently released uh, an RFA for uh, physician clinical support system medication assisted treatment to support physician education on the use of medications to treat opioid addiction. My understanding is the number of treatments have been approved by the FDA to directly treat o opioid abuse. Uh, one such drug that I'm aware of is, uh, and I'm probably going to mispronounce it, Vivitrol. Uh, how does CSAT plan to expand its efforts to increase awareness and knowledge about these new medications? Doctor, or either one of you. Um, uh, one of the things that we're doing is working with medical societies, uh, working with the treatment programs so that they're very much aware of the existence of the medication. We've promulgated advisories uh, uh, so that people can understand. And we're also meeting with the uh, manufacturers so that we have a better understanding of what their uh, strategies are. So we think this is a, an important issue. We work with the uh, FDA and ONDCP so that we can promulgate uh, increased access to treatment because that's one of our concerns, making sure that people have access to uh, new treatments as they develop, develop and uh, uh, that consumers have access to those. I thank you. I, I would point out, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I've heard a lot today about electronic medical records, and Dr. Cassie issued a concern, a warning, a, a broad interpretation of the Smith versus Maryland case upon which the NSA relies on in its current uh, standing would say that if you shared your medical records with a third-party insurance company, you may also not require, I don't agree with that interpretation, but you may also not require a search warrant to get those records. Uh, I don't think that's right, but that's another day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Now I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the panel being here. I want to follow up on some of the questions here about um, drugs used to treat opioid addiction. Uh, the current published information published by the FDA, F FDA and I address this to Dr. Throckmorton and Clark, allows for the use of generic uh, uh, buprenorphine, which is a subroxone in the context of the doctor-patient joint decision. However, there's a concern from psychiatrists who treat persons with addictions that the published indications are vague enough to allow for misinterpretation. Now, I've heard from doctors in my district that there's misinformation about when a doctor can prescribe generic buprenorphine versus the branded Suboxone strip. And so it's leading to access issues because pharmacists are concerned about prescribing the generic. Are, are any of you aware of a problem with this? issue? And if not, is that something you can get back to me on or we can communicate on later? I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm just trying to see if we can start a dialogue on that. It would probably be better if we if we had a little more specifics about, about that one. Um, Thank you. Th there I were recent issues about generic and innovator Suboxone. Um, there was a citizen's petition that was submitted to our agency that we responded to. I'm not sure if that's exactly it, but we, we'd be happy to follow up. And I'd, I'd appreciate questions. it. We yeah. can talk directly. Let me ask about this. Now, we're aware of all the overdoses and how much they have killed with prescription painkillers. Um, we know the states are collecting information on prescriptions, uh, but how this helps is still a concern. People can, uh, one person can go to 10 different pharmacies with 10 different prescriptions and collect those, and the states can sometimes then pick up if it's the same person. But of course, John Doe can also say, well, I'm filling a prescription for my grandmother, my aunt, and other, th other things, and the question is, can we find that person in the current system who may be using legitimate prescriptions, or the next step is false names, uh, et cetera. Uh, how d does this collecting information by the states help us in, in finding such persons? Could some of you comment on that? Yes, sir. Congressman, the, the two important um, parts of, of these PDMPs, which are then run by the uh, uh, state boards of licensure, one is that a physician can have that instant access to, say, to a new patient or, a, you know, the number of uh, uh, doctors that that patient is also seen uh, because these require, when they fill these uh, prescriptions, identification. The other is that a board of licensure and the states regulate medicine, not the federal government, can use that to identify a, a, a prescriber who may be uh, above and beyond and then take appropriate steps for inquiry. Uh, I think that uh, people do look at innovative ways around this, but the states with, uh, and I would recognize Kentucky as, a, as an example, uh, that have the most uh, uh, knowledgeable people running their PDMPs have been pretty successful in bringing this down. And of course, the other part of that goal then is to get somebody into treatment to reduce the problem. 
Well, well, let me add another element to this. A couple years ago, Congress passed a law saying that people were picking up Sudafed, had to show a photo ID, et cetera. Right. And our concern is, in terms of what you understand very well, for all of you, is that one person picking up multiple prescriptions for themselves, we can pretty much identify that may be an abuse, and that person can be picked up by the PDMPs, et cetera. One person who may be legitimately gathering prescriptions to pick them up for other family members, we have to somehow identify who is the person with the problem who is not. Can any of you comment on the concept of perhaps extending that, that uh, uh, requiring a photo ID so that person's name could also be checked if they are picking up more? I'd certainly be happy to uh, to tell you what uh, the state PDMPs are seeing uh, as, uh, as a result of that question. Be glad to do that. I any others have any comments on uh, thoughts that agencies may, may have about extending that? Well, w one agency that's not here would be the Drug Enforcement Agency, and I think th there are there are limitations on how people can fill prescriptions that are not written directly to them, and it, it'd be important just to to look into that. I, I don't know those details, so wouldn't wouldn't want to uh, try to answer. Dr. Clark, do you have any comments? And while we are uh, uh, thinking about this in, in a more formal way, I, I do know that many pharmacies, and especially the chain pharmacies, are requiring uh, photo ID on presentation, even for the person for whom the prescription is written. And whoever picks up the uh, drug, the uh, photo ID is required. So uh, uh, I, I know that people are concerned about sure. the issue. And I understand that the, the chain drug stores then <laughs> They, they will begin to raise questions themselves by contacting the doctor. And obviously, we want to stop the illegality of this, and we want to help the people in need. So I hope that's an area where we can move towards some. This is a concrete action that Congress can, can take on this, and I look forward to talking to you more about that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having the hearing today. Dr. Clark, you've spoken about SAMHSA's efforts to prevent prescription drug abuse in the first place, and you've also described SAMHSA's treatment activities when addiction disorders rise. Treatment of addiction to prescription drugs is of crucial importance, and, and as we all know, promising behavioral and medical approaches exist to treat this form of addiction. The Affordable Care Act builds on bipartisan legislation co-sponsored and supported by uh, m many members of this committee, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008, to ensure that more individuals suffer, uh, suffering from substance abuse use disorders receive the care they need. My first question is, how do you anticipate the Affordable Care Act will impact access to services for people who are addicted to prescription drugs or have other substance, to, uh, substance use disorders? One of the things that is in the uh, Affordable Care Act is, in fact, the provision of services for mental health and substance use disorders, which means that individuals who have uh, no coverage currently, and uh, that has been one, of the, that's been one of the barriers for people seeking treatment, uh, that barrier would be removed. So the Affordable Care Act will allow uh, health coverage for individuals who cannot afford the cost of care and they therefore will be able to engage in care. It will also allow for a broader reach for uh, using structures like uh, accountable care organizations so that we can uh, uh, identify individuals early before they develop full-blown addiction issues, risky behavior, if you will, uh, so that we will be able to intervene at an earlier uh, point in time. So Medicaid and the marketplace exchanges, whether they're state or national exchanges, uh, will expand the population uh, for those who receive substance abuse treatment? Indeed. Okay. It's clear from your comments the Affordable Care Act made it possible for many people with substance use disorders, uh, whether it's addiction to prescription drugs or, or um, illicit drugs, to access treatment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know we've had differences over the Affordable Care Act, but I hope we all share the goal of providing more robust treatment to those who are working over, uh, working to overcome prescription drugs. Um, Doc, uh, Director Kalkanowski, close enough, I hope. Uh, with your name like Green, it's not hard to, uh, to pronounce. How do you track the progress in competing, completing action items identified in the administration's plan and meeting the goals you've set? When we put together the prescription drug plan, uh, we brought everyone to the table uh, for a number of months, and uh, all of the uh, agreements that are
in there, continue into an interagency work group. So we set some specific goals, and then we bring that where those uh, those people that are closest to the problem and on the ground and had a responsibility for each of their agencies uh, together on a quarterly basis uh, to go over their progress. So we're starting to see, uh, uh, and I come from a profession that, that isn't known for its optimism uh, in law enforcement, but I uh, can tell you that seeing the, the, the changes that Dr. Clark and the chairman uh, talked about from uh, 2010 to 2011, I think we're starting to uh, turn the corner on this prescription drug problem. Good. Dr. Clark, I'm interested in hearing more about SAMHSA's coordination with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on surveillance activities. For example, you testified that SAMHSA funds the annual national survey on drug use and health, which collects data on non-medical use of prescription drugs, among other things. SAMHSA also oversees Drug Abuse Warning Network, or DOM, surveillance activities of drug-related emergency department visits and drug deaths. Um, is that partnership going to continue, and, and uh, if you have any more to share with the committee on that partnership, because uh, obviously we like agencies to work together. <laughs> and indeed, uh, we are working together. I think uh, the Assistant Secretary for Health, Howard Cole, and my immediate boss, uh, Pamela Hyde, uh, chairing uh, the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee. The objective is to make sure that we are working together. and. Uh, uh, Ms. Hyde works very closely with the director of the CDC to make sure that there is no uh, duplication of effort, but there is collaboration and coordination. Uh, and we have our uh, data teams working together. The uh, director of the Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality, uh, Dr. Uh, Pete Delaney, is working with the National Center for Health Statistics to make sure that we get the, the best data possible uh, dealing with the epidemiology of substance abuse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, the next gentleman. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all for coming. This is the first couple of questions for Dr. Throckmorton. And I've been a strong proponent. I'm from Kentucky, and, and we've been real aggressive with uh, trying to deal with the drug uh, problem in our, in our area, prescription drug problem. And the tamper-resistant technology has been important. Um, in your written testimony, you talked about the FDA. There were two recent determinations from the FDA on different formulations for OxyContin and for Opana ER. And can you take a minute to explain why there were two different determinations of those two cases about the drug resistant technology? And Sure, um, I, I'll, be, I'll be speak in, in general terms. Um, um, in both cases, we looked at the available data on that product in specific, the, the new formulation, and then looked at it in comparison with the, the earlier formulation, the formulation that had been originally developed. Um, and asked questions about whether or not the new technology promised to reduce abuse. We think it's terribly important that this bar, this, this bar of concluding something as abuse deterrent, be high enough to be worth developing, make it an incentive, make it something that we can reward in, 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 manu in labeling terms to make those products attractive for manufacturers to take the time and money to develop. Um, in, the, in the case of OxyContin, when we looked at the data, um, there were important aspects of the new formulation that really did predict it was gonna be harder to abuse. One particular one is when people tried to make it for, ready to inject. Mm -hmm. um, it, it turns into a gel that's just physically impossible to inject into someone's arm. We, uh, you know, some of that testing involved using people who are addicts trying to you know, do things that, you know, that would allow this to be used, and they were unable to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, so those sorts of evidence strongly suggest that a, a product with those formulation characteristics are, is going to have reduced attractiveness to abusers in the real world. We're tracking that real world experience now going forward. On the other hand, when we looked at the to to totality of the data around the Opana ER product, we didn't see data of that same kind, data that suggested that that product was really going to be meaningfully harder to abuse. Meaningfully meaning we would see less abuse. I want to ask you world. another one. I got one more I want to add, so, but I, uh, thank you for that. And there's, on Capitol Hill, there's been a lot of discussion about whether generic prescription opo o opo opioid must have identical abuse deterrent technology or whether it must simply be comparable or meet or exceed the, the, or the other drug. Can you discuss your perspective on this debate and what you're doing to ensure the process remains remain science-based and technology neutral? 
Absolutely, and, and, and um, I think it's a very important question. Uh, we, we're going to be talking about, we're working internally on and we're planning on talking about it at a public meeting at the end of September and early October. Um, I, what I anticipate is that we are going to rely on the generics demonstrating they are abuse deterrent, not that they use the same technology. That would, that would be the approach that we've used in other places. And so the testing that we'll lay out, the testing that we'll develop, will be to, to decide whether or not the new formulation, however it's made, is, 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 is abuse deterrent to the level that it needs to be compared with the innovator, not that it used the same technology. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Karolkowski a question, or just bring this up. Uh, a friend, very good friend of mine, his name's Tommy Loving. He's head of our drug task force. You know Tommy? And, uh, and, and very aggressive in this. And we get together quite. I'll see him in the morning, actually, for coffee, probably. And, and he brought up to me a few months, uh, months ago that heroin has really showed itself in an in a, in a alarming statistic. And I said, why is that, you know, heroin, that seems like something that was 1970s, I guess. And he said, because so, our legislators have been so aggressive with, with the pharmacies, with, uh, with the tamper-resistant, so now the prescription drugs are more difficult to get than heroin. And I just want to see, I know you are aware of that, just the strategy with that. It, it, the, the prescription drug abusers are now finding an outlet easier to get heroin than prescription drugs because we've been so good in our state of, of trying to control it. That, and that's, that has been going on for a while. The anecdotal evidence uh, across the country is that there is an increase in heroin, and some of the survey instruments are also showing that we have a younger population. There's another uh, uh, component about this, too, and that is that uh, young people are heroin naive. Older people really have an understanding of the dangers of heroin. Young people believe that it's not that powerful, that as long as they smoke it or snort it, uh, that they won't become an injecting drug user. And, of course, within a few weeks, they do become an injecting drug user. At the same time that uh, prescription drugs are uh, being made less available through all of the things that you've heard about today uh, and the cost. And heroin is, uh, is much less costly. So we have some real concerns about the heroin issue, and I couldn't agree with the Drug Task Force Commander more. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I want to give a little bit of historical perspective on the prescription drug monitoring program. And since my facts are oftentimes wrong, if I'm wrong, y'all can correct me. And then I want to just ask a couple of questions. Kentucky, as is my understanding, in 1998 started a prescription drug monitoring program. In 2002, uh, Hal Rogers uh, started the national uh, the, the prescription drug monitoring national training and technical assistance program at the Department of Justice. Now, that was an unauthorized program because this uh, committee has the jurisdiction. Since that time, it's received an average of seven or eight million dollars a year, and we all acknowledge and uh, say that it's been a ver an effective program. I don't think anyone would dispute that. But in 2005, this committee that does have jurisdiction, uh, recognizing the uh, success of that program, initiated NASPER. Uh, the only difference is that the Hal Rogers program was centered at the Department of Justice and NASPER was over at HHS. Uh, NASPER received funding in 2011 and 12, or I believe, uh, did not get funding. And as a matter of fact, someone at the Appropriations Committee in the report language in the omnibus bill even specifically said no money will be spent on NASPER. Uh, which uh, I thought was a little bit mean-spirited myself. But regardless of that, you three fellows are the experts in the area, and uh, I would ask you the question, do we need NASPER anymore? Maybe we should just eliminate NASPER and let's just focus on the Hal Rogers program. Or uh, should we try to combine them? Or uh, should we try to reauthorize NASPER? Uh, you know, I think a lot of the problems we have in the federal government uh, to, on a lot of programs is that Congress uh, d does not have a coherent, organized approach to dealing with the problem. 
So would you all just give us, because, may, I mean, our committee does have jurisdiction. Maybe we should reauthorize it and try to start over. But I would just ask for your guidance on this issue. And if each one of you would comment, I would appreciate it. I know that NASPER was, uh, uh, was designed to have a, a bit of a different take on the program versus uh, uh, the high technology of the, uh, uh, the Hal Rogers PDMP. Uh, we're pleased that there is still money, seven, as you said, seven to eight million dollars each year that is made available to the states to start up these, uh, these PDMPs. Uh, and I would be happy to sit down with not only uh, representatives from Congress, but also some of these interagency people and, and provide some, some level of, uh, of our expertise and what we've seen as to, uh, as to NASPER. We'd be glad to do that. I, I agree with uh, Director Kurlikowski. There needs to be a, uh, shall we say, a convening of minds to look at what it is that we're trying to achieve and how best can we achieve it. Uh, the specific program may not be the issue. It is the uh, technologies that, it, that exist, and it's bridging some of the limitations, and it's also dealing with, with some of the uh, conflicting imperatives associated with uh, both programs. So uh, our, our focus on linking prescription drug monitoring programs with electronic health records, working with the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology and uh, with the support of ONDCP in order to give practitioners real-time access. The amount of money in PMPs just hasn't been a large amount of money uh, in the first place. So the, the strategy might be how do we best use limited resources to uh, enhance our efforts to deal with the prescription drug abuse problem without compromising the health of people who uh, suffer from pain or other conditions requiring controlled substances. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, I might just suggest that and maybe in a private setting some of our staff could work with uh, these three gentlemen and their staff to determine what can we do to make this program even more effective. I mean, maybe all the uh, effort should be generated at the Hal Rogers program or, or maybe that there would be a combination or maybe there's something we can do. but. Since our program is no longer has expired, uh, on looking at reauthorization, I think it'd be helpful to have these discussions. Thank you. We'll we'll pursue that. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Now I recognize the uh, gentlelady from North Carolina, Mrs. Elmers, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for um, holding this subcommittee hearing. Thank you to our panel. Um, I have a couple of questions in regard to um, patient safety for those who truly are in need of pain medication and how, as we're trying to make the system more uh, effective um, for, you know, identifying abusers and, and how to use um, and, and um, work on that problem, how do we protect those patients as well? Um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, the Sudafed um, issue and how an individual has to um, basically show their license, their identification, um, and I know why that has been put in place. I'm, a little, I'm curious as to why that approach was taken. Um, is it because it was an over-the-counter drug initially, and then, um, and because it is used to formulate other drugs? Is it, Dr. Uh, um, Throckmorton, can you, can you tell us? a little bit about that approach because I'm concerned that we might take um, an approach like that into the future with others. I want to make sure that I understand the question you're asking. So with pseudoephedrine, pseudoephed itself mm -hmm. is not abused. It's Correct. Obviously what it's a being used to create Correct. highly dangerous you know, meth methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right, it was over the counter and and you know, Congress felt that there were additional restrictions that were necessary to ensure mm -hmm. the, the safe use of that product. Mm -hmm. um, that's different than the conversation we're having around hydrocodone, where right. it in and of itself is a product that has the mm -hmm. potential Addictive for abuse, abuse um, one that's already under some control for the you know, Drug mm -hmm. Enforcement Administration, the, the Schedule Three uh, mm -hmm. already has a, has a. So basically, the the difference being that that the Sudafed was a, was an agent that was used to. Create. You know, create another and so therefore that's, that's the, the idea difference. was to find out who was you know make sure that the, those individuals who were actually purchasing it were identified 
Um, the other issue, I guess, then um, on that is what what other uh, protections is the FDA putting in place to ensure that patients who who really are in need of those uh, those critical pain medications for you know whatever uh, whether it be chronic pain or acute pain, you know what what protections are in place so that again we might you know I I hate when we when the pendulum swings one way when really what we need to do is kind of come up with a real balance. Well, we we think there's several things to do. So first and, and foremost, we've been listening carefully. So. I've been now working on the opioids in, you know, for a substantial fraction of my, my time for the last several years, and I've had the opportunity to sit down with hospice care workers. I've sat down mm -hmm. with cancer survivors. I've sat down with groups that, are, that see the need for mm -hmm. access to pain medicines for patients that need them. I've also sat down with groups on, you know, that, that see the cost that prescription drug abuse is, 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 you know, mm -hmm. is having in America. So to fully understand sort of the broad spectrum of views, we're trying to listen as carefully as we can. Um, at the end of the day, one of the, the things that we concluded was the better educated people were about how best to use these medicines, and that means both the prescribers and the patients, the more comfortable we believed they would be in making the right choices. Mm -hmm. and the right choices here could be not mm -hmm. prescribing an opioid to avoid abuse, mm -hmm. ab avoid misuse, or it could be to make a choice to prescribe it because they're now educated well enough to know how to do it well, how to monitor that patient well, how to spot the signs of abuse. Sure. And, and so they're not, they're not, um, they're not scared to, okay. to use a, a word, um, to, to use the opiates right. On that, and thank you, because I think, that, I think that is the best approach as well. But if there is an individual right now who, um, and, and I appreciate especially working with hospice and, you know, certainly that's an area where those medications are used and, and I can see that issue occurring. But if there is an individual who, who, who feels that their, their pain, for whatever purpose, whatever reason, um, has an issue with access um, and, and feels that, that they are having difficulty um, obtaining, is there, is there a phone number? Is there, is there a way? Is there, who does that individual reach out to? Um, and, and any of you can um, comment on any of these things. I, it, partly it will depend on what the source of not being able to get the medicine mm -hmm. is. So if it's a drug shortage, for instance, that, that the drug is not available the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, some, sometimes drugs ha have gone into shortage recently mm -hmm. and we have um, shortages with fentanyl, for instance, mm -hmm. periodically or whatever. That's absolutely something the FDA wants to hear about. I have a, a staff that work on that. 24/7, trying to understand, prevent, minimize those shortages, and we have website a website at the FDA to to allow people to report. If, if it's a if it's a pharmacy not carrying the drug, those are decisions that the FDA doesn't doesn't have a, a clear role in, and and I would suggest boards of pharmacy or some other local authorities would be the place Thank to you. talk to. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. My my time ran over. Thank you Chair, very much. Thanks, gentle lady, and now recognize the gentleman. From Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, five thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing, and I thank the panel for their testimony. Along with many Floridians, I'm concerned about the alarming increase in prescription drug abuse and illegal sales of prescription uh, medications. I believe that issues concerning both overprescribing and the illegal use and sell of these uh, drugs should be addressed. Prescription drug abuse is both a federal and state issue, and I've worked with both local and federal officials to take on this issue. In my district, Pasco and Pinellas counties have had some of the highest oxycodone cause of death, uh, with 197. Hillsborough County, this is the Tampa Bay area, was fourth in Florida with 128 deaths uh, from oxycodone. Sadly, Pasco and Pinellas counties also led the state in methadone deaths and hydrocodone deaths. The number of ER-related visits from uh, misuse or abuse of prescription drugs has nearly doubled in the past uh, five years. Recently, there was a drug summit in Pasco County where both health officials discussed the growing problem of babies born addicted to prescription drugs. Pinellas County ranks first in the state for babies born addicted. Florida has taken some positive steps to fight prescription drug abuse, such as legislation to eliminate pill mills in 2011. Florida currently runs four drug tracking programs in addition to the controlled substance reporting system. 
the number of doctors on the DEA's list of top 100 purchasers of oxycodone declined by 97 percent in a single year, and pain management clinic uh, registration decreased by 36 percent. This is a good start, but there's much more work to be done. I'm sure you'll agree. That's why I've instructed my office to look into uh, issues of prescription drug abuse and uh, developing, of course, future legislation. And again, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate you holding this hearing. I, I have a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Kalikowski, I talked a bit about this, of course, the growing problem of uh, babies born addicted to prescription drugs such as the oxycodone. Uh, this is a serious problem in our communities. I'd like to have you come down, if you will, to the Tampa Bay area and meet some of the local officials, the health officials and providers who are dealing with this growing problem. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Are there any funds or programs available for the local community to tap into to help with the problem, either on the prevention or treatment uh, side? And, of and I also want to talk to ask uh, Dr. Clark, are there resources for, uh, for my community, of course, from uh, some from SANSA. So those are the questions. The Congressman, we, we fund the drug-free communities program, these grassroots communities programs that do prevention. And of course, uh, oftentimes that local voice is more powerful and more important uh, to people about prevention. And we have worked with them to help them understand and become more knowledgeable. Uh, we fund almost 700 of them uh, around the country to become more knowledgeable about this neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, because we're seeing uh, in a number of states, Florida, who is, uh, and I attended the first meeting of the advisory committee that, uh, that has worked so hard under the attorney general uh, to reduce that problem. Uh, it's a complex problem because there, there are women in pain that are also pregnant and are being treated. There are women in uh, drug programs uh, at the same time, and, uh, and so there, there has to be a very careful balance. But uh, I would also tell you I would be happy to visit the uh, Tampa Bay area uh, with you and, uh, and examine this more closely. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I welcome that. Uh, anyone else wish to, to comment on the panel? We have uh, uh, targeted capacity expansion uh, uh, grants that are available to the states. The states can use their uh, block grants uh, to help promote education. Uh, we are developing an internal strategy to deal with NAS. We recognize that it's much broader than uh, the, the uh, prescription opioids. It involves heroin. But as you know, that uh, uh, any time a woman has to take medication while she is pregnant, there is uh, some associated risk for the neonate. And so what we're trying to do is promote adequate education of uh, consumers and practitioners so that we can uh, address these issues. We have a pregnant and postpartum women's program that allows uh, women who have addiction problems to get into treatment uh, during the time that they are, are pregnant. And when they deliver, uh, we can deal with both the mom and the child. And the data do show that uh, the outcomes of the, the birth are uh, much more positive when we have those kinds of programs. But the most important thing is having this concerted effort uh, involving multiple layers of the, the, at the state level, at the local level, community level, involving practitioners as well as uh, uh, consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Um, the House is voting on the floor. There are less than 10 minutes. Uh, left to vote. Uh, that concludes the questions from the members. Uh, there might be other questions. We'll submit the, uh, those to you in writing if you'd please respond promptly. And members should submit their questions by the close of business on Friday, June 28th. Um, so thank you very much uh, to the witnesses, to uh, the members for attending. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.